The first Major League Hockey Championships in Texas belonged to the WHA Houston Arrows, decades before the Stanley Cup visited Dallas. Gordie Howe playing alongside his sons in Houston might be the team's enduring memory, but fans should also remember the Arrows as one of the finest Major League Hockey teams of the 1970s. I talked with WHA veterans about the legacy of the Houston Arrows. Well, actually, I, I played in Dallas in the Central Hockey League uh, for two years, so I knew that uh, Texas was, uh, they had some great hockey fans. The uh, first one was won at home, which was the second overall championship in the WHA. It was won at the Sam Houston Coliseum, and, and some of the fans were able to get on the ice and, and chase Teddy Taylor around the ice as, as he skated around with the uh, championship trophy, the Avco World Trophy. And of course, when you have the house there and the terrific job that uh, uh, Billy Deneen did running that club and, and uh, the front office, uh, it certainly wasn't a surprise. The WHA was experimenting teams in, in places that hadn't had major hockey before. And uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. It's a big city. Again, they were working hard behind the scenes and they certainly used the publicity of the Howe family to, to, push the, to push the game home to the fans. And they were very avid uh, fans. They loved their arrows and uh, it was almost a little bit intimidating when you were a visiting team going in there. Again, it was such a good team, and it wasn't a, a big, big arena either. The, the ice was kind of small, eh? and uh, they had good size, So, uh, and, but the fans just loved their arrows. They played in the old Sam Houston Coliseum at the beginning, and uh, in many ways it was like going into an old Detroit Olympia or an old Boston Gardens. Uh, it was very small, compact. They had a, a very, very good team, uh, coached by a great guy, uh, Billy Deneen. Uh, another thing, too, that I found playing down there was they did have an advantage, and I called it geographical, and that was because of the heat of Houston. Many of the teams, we were in Cincinnati at the time, or New England, uh, coming down there, the temperatures, we weren't used to the 80, 90 degrees with high humidity. We had some advantages in Houston because of the humidity and, the, and the, the ice was a little sluggish and you had to get used to it. I remember changing my underwear after the warm up and so Houston did have that, that uh, advantage. They were used to it and they played, played to that. So uh, uh, solid clubs, some geographical advantages, some legend, uh, they had a lot going for them. Well, the one thing that made it so different about going to Houston was the weather because you could be in Winnipeg or Quebec or Edmonton, you know, one day, and then on the same trip, end up in Houston. And the temperature differential was gonna be great, but the, uh, the enthusiasm that they had for hockey was pretty close to the same. They, they were excited about it. It was an event. It was something to really be seen at. And fashion conscious people in Houston came to the game. The success of the Arrows when we won the two championships fostered and was, as I mentioned before, was a part of the catalyst that built a brand new sports arena called the Summit in Houston, Texas. And, and that served for 20 some years as a, as a terrific venue. But one of the unique things about it was it had a tell screen or one of the first buildings in the United States that had this beautiful uh, screen for replays and presentation and really made a big difference to the quality of the game for the fans. Uh, one, year, one year they built their new arena. We used to play at the state fairgrounds or whatever and then they built a new arena. And I know we went in there and they, they had a sell out there all the time, every time. So I think they promoted the game well. They, uh, they uh, had a lot of talent there. Not far from where we are right now, I signed my first Arrows contract in the middle of the summer with the belief from Bill Deneen that this was really going to happen. And uh, I was, like a lot of other players, sort of on the bubble between the uh, NHL and the Western League or the American League, and I saw this as a great opportunity. So I joined on for three years with the belief that it was going to happen, and they did make it happen. They had a lot of experience with Bill Deneen, and Bill knew the players, uh, you know, both in the minors and in the National League, and perhaps even some borderline players that uh, felt that they needed a new opportunity. And Deneen was a master at finding that quality, hard-working, um, 
guy that could very well play in the National Hockey League. I would say that I was probably in a better position than most fellows that were putting the club together and that I did have familiarity with these players that a lot of other people didn't have. Guys like Brian McDonald, Murray Hall, Duke Harris, uh, these are guys that, that I had I played junior with or, or played in minor pro with. So there were a lot of my friends <laughs> that I had played with and other, other teams uh, that were coming to this new, new franchise. I kind of think they designed their team a little bit like St. Louis did going into the NHL. They, they had a lot of established, uh, I'd say major league talent, talent that was playing, a lot of them playing minor league, but they had, they had some veterans and they're, you know, they were, they had stability. I mean, they were coached, they were calm, collective. They, you weren't going to get them rattled. I mean, if you're going to beat them, you're going to have to, you know, outskate them and outplay them. They, they weren't going to self-destruct. Uh, they, they, you know, played within themselves, and they had a lot of talent. So it was, it was always a challenge. It was never, you know, strong on the blue line, like you said, good goaltending, and they certainly had some balance up front. So they were a complete team. Well, they always had a good team. Uh, they always, uh, you know, from what I remember of the WHA. You know, they were always a top-notch team to compete against and always done a good job, and Billy Deneen was their coach. They, they had a, a solid club, right from goaltending defense out. To me, the, the difference between someone like a Bill Deneen compared to maybe some other teams is that recognizing and putting a team together where they complement each other and play as a team because a lot of times you can you know, assemble the best talent, but if you don't play as a team, you know, you're not going to be successful. Benin would have not three lines, but four lines that were as uh, hard working, and you could put any line out there and it could play against anybody. I mean, and, and I think that, that was an important, um, I think, uh, part of what made the Arrow successful. And after a pretty darn good first year, our entire team, uh, midway through the summer, they had the opportunity to sign Gordy. June 19, 1973, a banner day for Houston, the WHA, and especially Gordy Howe. Hockey's all-time leading goal scorer fulfilled one of his biggest dreams that day by signing on with the same team as his two sons, Mark and Marty. Aero President Jim Smith signed Howe to a four-year contract estimated at $1 million. And so after 25 years in a Detroit uniform, Gordy Howe will now be wearing the number nine of the Houston Arrows. Hey, here's a, here's a guy, the greatest player of all time at that, at that point for sure, and still probably could be, for guys in my area, you know, you, you, you say Gordy was, was the greatest. And if you look at his records, pretty, pretty good. I mean, it's Gretzky or Gordy. I mean, and, and Gordy was different than Gretzky. Gordy used to do the things that made him famous. He sold, he sold tickets. He sold the game. Uh, he sold it in a lot of ways. Yeah, you'd get the elbow in the first period, and you'd get the face wash in the second period. And then the third period, he'd score the goal and get the assist, and you'd have you know, the Gordy Howe hat trick. Uh, I, I thought it was wonderful news because, you know, I mean, Bobby Hall obviously brought a credibility to the league, and Gordy even brought more. And uh, Mark was a very sought after young hockey player, so it, it was a real boost for the league. And, and Houston was certainly a franchise we were looking to in the league as, as something that would add some stability as well. It was hard to believe when I first heard that news. Uh, you know, Gordy is such a respected player and a, a legend in his own time. Um, we were like everybody else. We thought, he maybe he's a little, maybe he's too old. Maybe he, you know, is kind of thinking that can I really come back and get myself in shape to play major league hockey? It was it was a special season that first year when you watched um, just to be around to watch Gordy interface with the kids and and how step by step he got himself in shape and 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 then you know played as well as he played. And, and also to recognize the talent of the, of the, of the boys as well. Uh, I don't know whether it was it Doug Harvey that convinced them to uh, come back and play, which was kind of unique. Uh, I'm sure it was unique from their perspective to, to play with the boys. And, and the longevity of Gordy is uh, second to none. Yeah, you know, he, uh, when he came back, he played the same way that I left him in Detroit. He wasn't tired. 
He knew how to play the game. He knew he wasn't going to race up and down the ice with the, the young uh, speedsters, but he knew how to corner off the ice, play his own game, contribute to the, the game in its own way, and be important out there. He, he was a vital part of the industry that the Houston Arrows uh, put together. And uh, he was not just there as a token player. No, he earned his way. You know what? When the World Hockey League folded the Arrows, uh, uh, folded, where did that Gordy go? National Hockey League. Figure it out. He may not have been as fast as he was when he was 20 years old in the NHL, but he was still a good hockey player. He had the talent and he had the respect of all the other players on the other teams. Every player that went against him knew Gordy and we respected him, not only for his talent, but for his fig, uh, physical prowess. He knows the game. He knows where to be. He knows what to do. And he certainly has this aura about him that he, he if he has to show a bit of a mean streak, he's more than willing to do so. But he played the game the way the game's supposed to be played, and uh, I think the players respected that. And you still had to know where he was because he could put the puck in the net. And of course, he could turn it around and he could shoot left-handed as well. He would come across the blue line. I believe he was a normal right-handed shot, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, because it seems to me I remember him coming down my left-hand side and he would take the puck across after he crossed over the blue line and switch over to shoot left-handed. So that was certainly something I'd never seen before and, uh, and uh, I didn't even know he did it. One night we played in, uh, I think it was Quebec. We flew all night on a DC-3 plane. We, we got a little spot on the plane so Gordy could at least lie down. I mean, here's a 44-year-old guy and we're playing a Sunday afternoon. We're coming from, we're coming, we're gonna fly all night. We're gonna get about four or five hours sleep and we're playing an afternoon game back in Houston. Gordy goes out there <laughs> and scores five goals in, 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 in this game. I mean, guys are just shaking their heads. And, and we get a penalty. And Deneen knew you would use Gordy to kill penalties to, to even. So Gordy's out there after scoring five goals. He's out on the ice. He's, there's only maybe five minutes left. We're, we're winning the game by, I don't know, eight to three or something like that. And, and uh, and the puck goes back to the point, and Gordy goes out and throws his body in front of a slap shot. Takes, takes a slap shot right in the chest, and the guys on the bench just kind of <laughs> looked at each other and said, this is, uh, but it was, that, that was Gordy. Me, the old man, I just have to stand in there and try to use some of that finesse, which I've learned over 25 years of the hockey, because in my at my age bracket and the some of the punishment i have taken through the league i know i'm not as quick as i used to be and i'm not as strong as i used to be but hopefully the um, experience that i have will help somewhat in the way of the cause of houston arrows to maybe get up and top you know it was it was uh, it was very interesting in that uh gordy hadn't lost really a lot of steps and was basically as mean as ever Gordy was a, the meanest, probably dirtiest hockey player that ever ever played, and 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 maybe because he was, uh, I I don't even know that he was even defending himself. I think it was just in his nature. I mean that's that's how how hard nosed or how determined he was as a player. He was a very very determined player and loved to play. I mean he he had he he played that hard in practice. Anyways, I got pushed into the bench. I'm a rookie. And I get pushed into the Detroit bench. My gloves are off. And the first guy I hit is Gordy Howe, right on the head. And I looked at him and I said, Oh, Mr. Howe, I'm so f***ing sorry. He looked at me and he said, Get out of here. I saw him just do some incredible things. I, I just, uh, he would wait for players to hurt him, it seemed, when he had the puck. You know, there was no reason for it. He just, uh, uh, I don't know why he did it. We asked him one time, actually, and uh, he said, do what? You know, he didn't realize he was doing it. So uh, right from the get-go, uh, you know, he made everybody aware that uh, he didn't want to give any quarter or, and he would take as much as he possibly could. So, you know, and Gordy uh, forever had that bit of a mean streak. He'll laugh about it now. Bit of a mean streak in him. And, uh, you know, you had to be very careful when you played against him. Not showing respect, but uh, just knowing where he was coming from. 
one of the toughest individuals that I had ever played against. Uh, there's very few people that you go into the corner with and you know you're going to come out hurt. And, and uh, Gordie Howe was one and Moose DuPont was another one with Philadelphia. And so uh, to see how play and to see how he earned the respect of, of uh, the other players was very interesting. Gordie had a lot of space on the ice and for a lot of years. And, and uh, so I think I had a having that knowledge as to just how much space you can give him. I think I gave him maybe a little less than some other players did. And, uh, but uh, he was a good friend of mine. We roomed together when I was in Detroit. And so it was fun to play against him. I mean, he'd, he'd make comments out there. We'd chat a little bit uh, where most players, you know, kept their distance from Gordy. A unique individual, there's no question. Uh, you know, you, you respected what he could do on the ice and, and you certainly respected what he could do for you as a teammate. and I would say if I'd have had a choice throughout my career, it would have been much easier on his team than against him. When somebody asked me today who was the, uh, the, your biggest thrill play in hockey, it was playing with Gordy and, uh, and getting to know him. And uh, I mean, uh, he's an assassin on the ice, but he's just a beautiful man off the ice. And uh, it's some hard, hard to put those two together sometimes with some of the things I saw him do. A class gentleman, the most humble superstar you can meet in sports, uh, I'd put Gordy right at the top of the list. And then to see all three Howes skating there, uh, wow, that was, that was really something to, to see them all together, it, it had really happened. I'm really looking forward to playing with the old guy here, but uh, <laughs> no, uh, he's the greatest player in the NHL and uh, should help me out quite a bit if I play with him. So. Well, I got to play against Marty and Mark. They were both the same age as I was, so I got to play junior against them. And uh, so I knew about them. I played minor hockey uh, in some big tournaments. I got to play against them. So I knew about them coming up through. And, and uh, yeah, I think it was because they were Gordy's boys that, that, you know, you're sort of in awe of them. There certainly was a lot of pressure on Mark and Marty uh, later on in my career. I had a chance to play both with them and Gordy, and uh, uh, they're two young, outstanding men. Uh, they had their father there to kind of give them the guidance. They also had their mother, Colleen, behind the scenes. And she, was, uh, she was a real force to be reckoned with, with contracts and organizing and keeping the boys focused in the game. So, uh, and, and the other thing, too, was they were really, really good players. You know, Gordy, you know, Gordy would, uh, I think he loved the game so much. So he, not only did he want to play with his sons, but when he was on the ice playing, he was playing for Gordy as he has all these years. They were both talented. They, they, you know, on their own, they could have played in that league. Uh, I think that with, uh, with, with Gordy there, it gave them a little more confidence. But, uh, you know, Mark certainly went on to have a great hockey career. And, and, and Marty, you know, uh, played a long uh, time also. And, and uh, I think just having their dad there in the beginning was a good stepping stone. But they, were, uh, they, they stood alone. They weren't there just because of Gordy. They were there because of their ability. Uh, they added to uh, the overall uh, success of the Houston team. And certainly for them to be able to sit down and say they're playing with their dad, I, I mean, what, that had to be a dream come true for the two of them. Mark was, I think, one of the best, I mean, in skills. I mean, great skater, but he, he had a touch. He could pass the puck, really, as well. And the unique thing is, the first year he played forward. He was a left winger with his dad on the line. Jimmy Sherritt was the centerman between Mark and, and Gordy. Bill Deneen, and this is the uh, another thing about Deneen that, that really, Bill knew he could watch players. Bill made the move and put Mark back, and if you look at his at Mark's NHL career, he was a defenseman. I mean, here's a, a young kid that had great passing skills, great sense of uh, the ice and everything, and Bill put him back on defense. He made him a Bobby Orr, in effect. And, and if you look at uh, Mark's uh, record, I think it shows that that was an amazing, pretty sh uh, shrewd uh, move by Deneen. And they were a breath of uh, fresh freshness in the World Hockey League. They, they, they were what the World Hockey League needed, and they made the arrows the class of the league. There was a game against the Winnipeg Jets, uh, uh, a game where the arrows trailed three to nothing. Uh, 
going into the third period. Gordy Howe was ejected by the referee, Ron Asselstein, for making contact with him. Asselstein actually left the ice, went to the, he was so upset by having a confrontation with Gordy Howe, was getting out of his gear, heading for the shower. He was quitting, it was all over. He had to be coaxed by Bill Deneen, the Arrows coach and the other coach for the Winnipeg Jets at the time, to come back and finish the game. Gordy was a presence, uh, even in the playoffs. Uh, that year, uh, he was in the top 10 in scoring in the playoffs. Uh, very protective of his sons, I might add. Uh, you didn't want to get too close to them when Gordy was around. But uh, he handled the puck. He, uh, he, he just, uh, again, he was a presence. And the way he uh, created uh, and saw the ice and that, I mean, you can't teach that. And uh, no, he was still a player. He, he did quite well for Houston that year. I don't think I ever met a fella that had as determination as he did. Like when Wayne Gretzky was breaking all his records, I used to kind of chuckle watching on the TV that here Gordy Howe was shaking his hand for breaking his records, but inside he was going to tear him apart because that's how he played. In those day, even in those days in the WHA, you don't touch Gordy or any of the sons because he'd come right in there and he wasn't afraid to battle. I saw one of my teammates, Jim Mika, uh, actually saved uh, another player on our team, Mike Stevens' life, because Mike Stevens had a hip check, a very good one actually, and he took out Mark. And Gordy was coming and, and would have killed him if Jim hadn't body blocked him. And then Jim immediately jumped over the boards. On one occasion, Mark came out of the zone and flipped the pass up ahead to his father, Gordy Howe. And Gordy made a move and went to the boards and shook off an attacker, and Mark broke for the open hole up ice. And Gordy got around the guy, and Mark turned and looked back, and he was passing right in front of my broadcast location. And real quickly, the play developed, and suddenly there he was in the hole wanting the puck. And he turned and he said, Dad, it was a moment I'll never forget to be able to, to hear that. I felt that that was something very special. I think it would be a special challenge for anybody who carried that name, the, the one thing that they did carry. But uh, from my observation, they were you know, wonderful people, really great people. They really, um, they really respected their name and they lived up to that respect. When you mention a guy like Terry Ruskowski or, or John Tonelli or Ted Taylor, great leadership on that club. The two captains that team had, Teddy Taylor for all those years and at the end Terry Ruskowski, you couldn't find better leaders. Other than, than the Howes, a lot of the players were, were journeyman players. You know, the, the, the Larry Hales, the, the Duke Harris's, the, the Hughes, the McLeods. If you take um, Larry Lund's line, you know, Frankie Hughes and Andre, I mean, they, they had perfected, they were unique in their own style of hockey. They, they, they were a really, really good solid hockey club. They had a lot of ex-players from Phoenix in the old Western League and uh, they had Smokey McLeod and Goal and uh, Andre Hines and some really, really great players. In, in the playoffs that second year, went 12 straight, won each won every series in four straight games, which was, I mean, uh, that team was he head and shoulders above almost everybody. Cam Connor, a big strapping winger, who was a first round draft choice of the uh, Montreal Canadiens, who originally was signed by Phoenix and traded to Houston. Uh, good guys. Wayne Rutledge, one of the goaltenders. Gordon Labossier, who was uh, the godfather to our first son. Uh, Larry Lund, uh, just so many classy people, classy individuals. Uh, Paul Popeil, a, a defenseman. The mix that Deneen went after were, were hard-working, good veteran players, uh, and, and the type of player was led by a guy by the name of Teddy Taylor. Teddy, Teddy's the first guy to meet you when, you when you're traded there or whether you come there and and he established the, uh, the ethic for everybody else. He worked harder than everybody else. Uh, he was truly a nice man. Um, 
He would, uh, if there was somebody particularly tough on the other team, uh, Teddy would, uh, would arrange a posse and, and, and try and take care of that. You know, it was never up to just one guy. It was always the team with him. He was the best captain that I ever played with. You could learn a lot about being a leader from him. A lot of the guys looked to Teddy. Teddy was a, was a physical player. He was a tough guy. He didn't look for it, but he could handle it. And if it came, you know, he'd take care of anything. But he, he was just one of the leaders. I mean, he didn't have to say much. He was just a great guy. Well, I think many times it's a, uh, an experience thing or it's a popularity thing. And, and with Teddy, it was, a, like you mentioned, it was an earned thing. Teddy was the guy and he earned it. He, he had everybody's respect. He had the management, he had the players, and uh, uh, he earned it every day. So it wasn't just an honorary thing, and, and uh, I don't think the C itself meant anything to Teddy, but being a leader meant something to him. I don't think if you asked anybody that ever played against Teddy that they would say there was anybody any harder to play against. You know, he was, he was a dedicated, hardworking, winning, hockey player and and that's what I think uh, Bill went after. John Tonelli who later went on to uh, win four uh, Stanley Cups with the uh, uh, New York Islanders and, and Gordy Mark and Marty Howe I mean you, you can't find any better. As I remember it we we, we had some great young kids uh, and, and uh, Tonelli and Ruskowski and Preston and, and Lukowicz and I mean just just uh, and, and we picked up uh, uh, Wakely and Goal and who had a great year for us. The, the Arrows were having a tough time financially. Uh, couldn't pay the house with what really they should have been paid because they were a big part of the uh, legacy of the Houston Arrows and the, the history of the uh, club. It was something we thought we were going to miss Gordy and, and, uh, and Mark, Marty tremendously and, and yet we had really a good team and it was I guess a surprise and, and having Lacroix there helped out. And, I mentioned all these other young guys that really came into their own. So I think players just take things in stride. You know, sure, they would love to have them there. But they got Andre Lacroix and added some other players uh, coming to the Arrows. I, I think they just, you know, you play the hand that you're dealt. And they were dealt a hand without Gordy Mark and Marty Howe. Six years of playoffs, four first places, and two Avco championships proved the Houston Arrows are ready to join the National Hockey League. I actually got a, a, a telegram or an aerogram uh, saying that uh, we were going to merge with Colorado and uh, that we were going in the NHL. And uh, another fellow, a friend of mine, John Gray, and I would have been the oldest guys on the team at 27. And there was all kinds of talent. And we said, this is just going to be fantastic. The franchise in Colorado in the uh, NHL, Schnitzer thought he had that franchise coming down to Houston, but the owner in uh, Colorado wanted Houston to buy the franchise. They said, no, no, you just rent the building from us. And uh, a day later, I got the, the next telegram saying that uh, it was all over. Not only we're not going to the NHL, we're, we're, we're folding operations. So he sold it to John McMullen in New Jersey, they became the Jersey Devils, New Jersey Devils. They could have been the uh, Houston Arrows. I, I would say in my career was one of the most disappointing things because I still believe um, that, that uh, Houston is a good candidate to support a, a, a solid NHL franchise. I mean, if, if Dallas can do it, certainly Houston's a bigger city. Um, Houston does well with the, the minor league arrows now. Houston, Houston supported us, and, and they certainly would have supported an NHL team, I think. The people there were dedicated, they worked hard, they, they loved the arrows. The uh, receptionist for a while was a, a very wealthy Houstonian, a, a lady who loved hockey who just volunteered. So uh, that was kind of, and we all sacrificed at one time, we sacrificed paychecks to keep the team afloat. You know, Houston had a good team, a good, solid team for, you know, a number of years. And they were always, I would say, the toughest in every area of the game to play against. You know, they had, they had the, the toughness about them. They had the finesse. They had Gordy and his kids. 
And I think it was just a fine organization, and they won the AFCO Cup, you know, a number of years back to back, and uh, they were outstanding.